Well, the growing split in the GOP between the establishment and the Tea Party is going to make for a tense 2014 for a lot of Republicans in primaries. The Republican rift is already popping up in primaries across the country. Veteran senators like Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham facing tough challenges from the right. Their struggle against members of their own party will be one of the bigger stories in 2014. But a major Republican rift is nothing new. And what's interesting is why the grand old party split the first time and how it cost Republicans the White House for two terms. According to my next guest, the drama starts with these two guys, heavyweights, literally and figuratively, Teddy Roosevelt and William Howard Taft. They were close friends, buddies originally, but things got ugly. Roosevelt was thrust into the presidency when McKinley was assassinated, and he relied heavily on Taft as his secretary of war. When Roosevelt's second term ended, he'd hoped the press and the voters would trust his judgment and elect his buddy Taft. Roosevelt even became Taft's chief campaign advisor. Taft won but started siding with the conservative wing of the party. He opposed Roosevelt's regulation on business at every turn. This, of course, infuriated Roosevelt, who decided to run again for president in 1912, and he launched an all-out attack on Taft. Two candidates delivered divisive speeches at the convention. The attendees started yelling at the speakers. Roosevelt stormed out to form his own party, and in the end, the split caused both men to lose to Democrat Woodrow Wilson. So what does this Republican rift 100 years ago have to do with today's fights and the media? We'll get some interesting insights in the new book. The Bully Pulpit, Theodore Roosevelt, William Howard Taft, and the Golden Age of Journalism. Boy, if you say so. I'm joined now by the Pulitzer Prize winning author and historian Doris Kearns Goodwin. I tell you, I, I, have, I am a huge consumer of Teddy Roosevelt biographies. I can't wait to do the, uh, read this one. Um, so the lesson learned here that we're supposed to take away from this fight, are we characterizing it correctly and are there some similarities? Well, the interesting thing is that Teddy and Taft start out much more aligned politically, not only when they're friends decades ago, but even in the presidential years, they both believed in the power of government to soften the problems of industrialization, to break up the trusts, get workers' compensation. But then when Teddy goes to Africa and Taft is left on his own, he knows he has to get a tariff reform bill through, which is a really rupture within the Republican Party, even without him. And he doesn't know how to do it right without depending on the old guard in the Congress. And they had such power. Teddy had never really transformed the party. They produce a compromise bill. The progressives are furious. Teddy comes back and thinks Taft has really gone way over to the other side. He hasn't, but there's enough perception to allow Teddy to say, I think I better come over and take this leadership away. He always wanted to be in the center. And then the divide between them is heartbreaking for both of them. It obviously became a, a personal divide. I guess what, what's fascinating to me, though, is that the Republican Party then, and frankly throughout, and if you look at, at, at who followed with Warren Harding and, and Coolidge and Hoover, is essentially... They left. They let the Teddy Roosevelt uh, wing of the party go and never try to get him back. Fair? Absolutely fair. In fact, you could argue that in 1912, the progressive wing of the Republican Party was so far ahead of its time that it absolutely foreshadowed the New Deal in terms of what it was calling for. Once Teddy loses and the Woodrow Wilson wins, the progressive party wing diminishes and never really comes back in full form. And it changes the whole history of the country as a result of that. I mean, at that 1912 convention, if you were in the lobby and you had a Taft delegation badge on or a Teddy one, people would fight each other. There were a thousand policemen there. So the rift was, if we think it's bad today, I mean, Taft called Teddy a danger to the republic. Teddy called him a fathead with a guinea pig head. Right. And it was a really, really terrible rupture, but it had huge consequences historically. So why is it the golden age of journalism? Because there were a group of progressive journalists who created the stories about Standard Oil and what it had done unfairly, about the meatpacking plants, about railroad abuses, so about corruption in the So this is Upton Sinclair. City. This is sort of the... Exactly. The, yeah. And what happens is those stories become the common conversation of the country, and then Teddy can use the bully pulpit to push those Congress people who don't want to do anything to have to force it. So from the outside in, he got all this legislation passed and kept the Republican Party together until it finally split apart. You know, I, I, I'm, the more I've always studied the split between Taft and Roosevelt and that split in the Republican Party, what's, what's, more, what's a more correct statement now, looking back on it 100 years later, that the Roosevelt wing of the Republican Party disappeared or that essentially the Democrats, which that time were not considered their progressive wing, you know, they had one, there's no doubt, and it came out of the Midwest, but essentially 
the Roosevelt wing of the party merged with the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, and that formed a new Democratic Party, even though we never call it that. I think you're right, because what distinguished the Democrats and the Republicans at that time <clears throat> was that the Democrats were states' writers still, right? So they right. didn't believe in the federal power to do these things that had to be done socially. Once they began to merge, then even under Wilson, then they believed that the federal government had to be the instrument for social reform, and the southern states' writers lost some of their power. So it's fair to say that Teddy Roosevelt, <laughs> in, in many ways, is a founding father of the current Democratic Party that we see today. You know, in Almost a funny way, you could say that. He founded the modern presidency. He argued that the president should be the steward of the people. He argued that government had a central role to play in the social and economic life of the nation, which it hadn't done at all since the Civil War. It was a big deal that he made government a central figure over the private power of the robber barons that were running around at that time. I w just put your uh, put what the president uh, President Obama's current political situation, the issue with health care. Put it in some historical perspective. Is this is this are we in one of these moments that this is just going to be maybe the the single most important three month period of the Obama presidency, or are we in one of those hyperventilating moments that'll just disappear and we won't remember it? Well, it'll depend so much on whether this rollout gets rolled out. You know, I think there's a certain sense in which, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a certain sense in which the bully pulpit still is an important tool for a president, and whether it's been diminished or not, just, not just under Obama, but just structurally, because you don't have that common conversation anymore. You've got cable networks that people are mm -hmm. watching. Before the president even finishes a speech, the pundits, including sometimes myself and you, are out there tearing <laughs> it down. People's attention span is limited. So can you still educate the public. I mean, obviously, the public still doesn't understand what that health care bill is all about. How much of that is Obama's fault? How much is it, is it the media today that makes it harder than right. it was at Teddy Roosevelt's time? Well, I think there are tools that they've never used, uh, the Obama administration, new media tools that they could have done for education, whether it's whiteboards, whether it's a lot of videos, web videos, there's a ton they could have done. Anyway, I have to leave it there. The Bully Pulpit, another, another uh, fascinating look at history through the eyes of Doris Kearns Goodwin. Good to see you. Thank you, Chuck.